Today I'll provide a presentation which will really sort of recap a lot of my PhD work uh, and then work that I've done as a postdoc. Um, the, the presentation really is, I guess, in three parts. I'm going to start off by looking at the, the response of, uh, of the sea urchin to a changing environment in, in southeast Australia. Um, I'm then going to look at um, aspects of the resilience of these kelp bed system with a real focus on predators in the system. Um, and, and lastly, I'm going to provide a real teaser of, of, the, of, of my postdoc work that has just been completed but, but not yet published. So um, that's, that's really um, looking at, at large-scale experimental manipulations, kind of bringing everything in together. Okay, so in, in southeast, uh, southeast Australia, um, we've got this uh, really what's known as a, as a, uh, a global hotspot of, of ocean warming. Uh, we've been warming at about 2.28 degrees per century, which is about four times greater than the background ocean warming trend. Um, and, and, and it sort of represents one of the fastest rates of warming in the southern hemisphere. Um, and, and here, re really what's driving a lot of this warming is, is, a, is a change in the strength of the East Australian current, which is the major feature here uh, on the eastern seaboard of of Australia, um, the, max, the, the point of maximum uh, strength of the, East, the EAC back in the 1950s used to reach uh, off the New South Wales coast um, up, up around Sydney. Um, but in, two, in, uh, in the, uh, in the 50 odd, 60 odd years uh, in between, um, between the 50s and, and current, we've seen this about a 350 kilometre southward shift in, in, in this major current feature. Um, and so, so it's really been quite dramatic in terms of the change in the physical environment. Um, and, and as you might expect, there's been a really strong biological response to this changing environment. So we've got all these new species which are kind of typical of northern uh, uh, mainland Australia that, that have now established and extended into eastern Tasmanian waters. So there's a list of about 45 species of fish that are, are documented to be range extenders. Um, and, and of all these species, um, some of them just sort of seem to be in the system quite passively um, um, and, and, and not really sort of having an impact. Um, but really, one of the most important new species we now have in eastern Tasmania is, is the long spine sea urchin, Centra Stephanus rogers eye. Um, so this species uh, is, was native to, to New South Wales where it occurs in really high abundances. Um, and, and, and basically, this, this species was first picked up in the late 1960s in, in the Bass Strait Islands. Um, in 1978, the first individual was identified off St Helens uh, on mainland Tasmania. About the mid-1980s, it turned up in the southeast. Uh, and in 2005, we found uh, a couple of individuals down in the southwest. Um, so this sort of... this timeline of, of discovery along the coast is, is really is consistent with the strengthening of the East Australian current uh, transporting the, this larval form which spends about three months in the plankton uh, which is sort of ample time for the, for, for the EAC to advect this larvae uh, southward. Um, and, and of course the, the key feature of this species and what makes it different amongst the, the whole range of new species we have on our coast is its ability to, to act as a habitat modifier and convert these sort of lush, luxuriant uh, and diverse kelp beds into these widespread sea urchin barrens. Um, if we take a closer look at uh, the, the environmental signal on the coast, you can really see clear evidence here of this, this East Australian current feature. Now, this is a, a wintertime pattern where the EAC can really be seen as, as like a, basically a heat pump that regulates the, the, the coastal environment of, off Tasmania, even in wintertime. It's, it really does expand uh, in greatest... Um, pushes south in, 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 in greatest, with greatest force in the summertime, but, but as you'll sort of learn now, that it's these processes during winter that, that seem to be really important in driving a lot of these range extensions and, and is particularly important for this sea urchin. But here you can see the timeline of discovery. Um, if, if you just look at the basic biogeography of the sea urchin uh, relative to the EAC, it's kind of, it's quite really, it's quite revealing in terms of the role in which this current plays. So, so the sea urchin is sort of present but very rare in, in these islands. It's abundant on this one individual Kent group island, but as you move further west, it's basically absent um, in Victoria and, and, and western Tasmania and, and present but only very rare in the southeast. If we then uh, look at the, the distribution of the sea urchin, and this is work that I basically did uh, out of, uh, after finishing my honours uh, research, where we basically surveyed, uh, I think it was about 150 sites along the coast, but these are the main, uh, we had 14 main regions at which we were surveying. This black, line, black, black bars here are, is the density of sea urchins, and as you can see, there's this sort of general decline. There's, there's kind of a fair bit of variability along the coast, but you get this general decline as you move south in, in uh, eastern Tasmania. 
the open bars here are, is the percentage cover of barrens of, of those reefs. And, and, and again, it, it's, it, it maps fairly well with um, the abundance of the sea urchins and again shows this pattern of declining uh, numbers of sea urchins as you move down the coast. Um, if we look at the, the age structure, I, I, I looked at a... Um, I, I tagged the populations and looked at a, um, developed a calibrated growth model uh, and, and basically was then able to look at the, the population structure and we found this really clear evidence of, of these younger and younger age uh, structures as, as we move further south. And if we look at the mean population here, we have an average age of 20 years which grades down to about five years at these very younger populations in the south, which is consistent with this sort of timing of the expansion of the urchin um, and, and also this, uh, the, the pattern of abundance on the coast. Um, it's all consistent with this strength of the East Australian current, um, giving uh, opportunities for recruitment in the southeast part of, of Tassie uh, in, in more recent times compared to uh, these populations that are older and, and, and more well established and, and where the greater extent of barrens have been formed. If we now just sort of take a bit of a dive into the system, really how these barrens, or what we sort of see at a lot of the places in eastern Tasmania, these kind of little plaques or these grazers, grazing um, halos or what we call incipient barrens in intact kelp beds, these little patches then coalesce and so you start getting all the understory eaten out. And then these patches really co coalesce and, and you get these widespread um, barrens occurring. Um, this is a barren off St Helens, which um, by all reports we had healthy kelp beds back here in the 80s. Uh, we have some aerial photography showing um, uh, giant kelp surface canopies in areas where, which are now sea urchin barrens due to this range extending sea urchin. And, and the, the population age here is about, about that 20 year um, mark. Um, so just to conceptualise th this formation of, of barrens, here we have the healthy kelp bed. We get these little plaques forming um, and, and then we get this flip to, to the widespread barrens. So if we look at this in terms of sort of an, uh, the, the XY dimensions here, we have uh, increasing seaweed cover. So we have a healthy seaweed bed here at the top and we have increasing sea urchin densities. Basically the system, we, we've got a lot of data as, as shown here is we can we can sort of, the kelp beds can tolerate quite a large density of urchins, but at some point um, the whole system tips down to sea urchin barrens. And, and as Bob ele elegantly described earlier on, uh, we've got this evidence of this uh, of, of alternative forward and reverse shift pathways. So basically once the system flips into barrens, you have all these positive feedback systems which makes it really hard to get back out. So you don't just follow along this line, you've basically got to reduce urchin density all the way back down to very low levels before you get kelp recovery. And it's interesting here, if, if I'd have plotted up biomass density here, we kind of sit around that 0.2 kilos per square metre. Uh, once we get below that, we seem to get recovery of, 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 the, uh, of the kelp beds. Um, so yeah, we have this real evidence of, of these uh, alternate um, stable states and, and the different um, forward and reverse shift pathways. Um, so basically another, the way I also like to um, look at this is to is, is to visualise this ball bearing on this corrugated surface where um, where the, the alternative valleys represent the alternative stable states of kelp beds and sea urchin barrens and the depth of that valley representing the resilience of the system. And so therefore to move from one system to the next it really needs to be um, uh, pushed to, to a fair degree. Um, if, if we now just look at this, is uh, just summarising an experiment I did. So this is really looking at that reverse shift pathway. So basically the, this is uh, urchin barrens here. These are these smaller incipient patches. You remove the urchins, within a couple of months you have recruitment of the kelps and within sort of 18 months you have a, an in, intact canopy again. So if you just follow this brown line here, this is the total cover of canopy forming kelps uh, post removal of the urchin. So you know, the system actually does respond quite quickly um, when, when the conditions change. Um, so one of the other things I did was look at what is the total effect of, of this grazing, of this one range extending species on, on the broader ecosystem in terms of the total uh, abundances of, of critters there. So in the recovered kelp bed, we sort of had, uh, had up to 253 uh, of, these, of these taxa that are associated with that kelp bed habitat. Uh, when the barrens form, you get a, a massive reduction in, in terms of the total number of, of, of invertebrates that actually live on the reef. So you're kind of losing... On, on average a, a net loss of about 150 taxa when these barrens form. So there's a really strong impact on biodiversity of, of this basically this one range extender coming into the system and having a rather, you know, really massive flow and effect to the whole structure and function of the system. Um, but we also get declines in, in the abundances of species that people really care about. So here, this is Haliotis rubra, so the abalone. So as the urchin density increases, we get declining numbers of 
of abalone, and all, which is about worth $120 million a year to the Tasmanian economy. And, and again, with the rock lobsters, as, as we get increasing sea urchin densities, we get a decline in, in the number of rock lobsters, which is worth a lot of money. And, and I guess I'll make the point here that all the research that I've been involved with is, has been funded through, uh, through industry. Uh, basically, the concern and the threat that this sea urchin poses, um, this is where, I guess, the means to all this research has, has come from. Um, so one of the first things that we wanted to look at is, um, just because the, the sea urchin has arrived here, um, if it wasn't reproductively active here and, and, and there wasn't the potential for self-recruitment on the coast, it's kind of a completely different situation than if, uh, than if the sea urchin is now present and reproducing and, and, um, and basically has a much higher chance of self-recruitment to the coast. So, I really wanted to separate to see whether, whether it was just larvae coming down from the mainland occasionally that was driving this population or if this population was really up on its feet and away and running. And really what we saw from the gonad index is we had this clear evidence of a reproductive cycle with a major spawn out um, in this sort of August period. So, so this is gonad index but also overlaid here is, this, is the population of the of, of the, uh, the proportion of the population responding to, to KCL uh, artificial injections. And so we saw really strong overlap. Um, and this all occurred in, in, in our winter. So August, obviously winter in the southern hemisphere. It was a bit of a paradox in that this is the coolest time of year and this is when the sea urchin is, is spawning. Um, even, just because we had this reproductive cycle, I wasn't convinced that we could actually have viable larvae or viable gametes on the coastline. So you know, could the larvae develop here? Well, we just didn't know. I then ran a bunch of experiments looking at the rates of fertilisation across temperature uh, and you can kind of see there's a lot of scatter in this and keep an eye here, we've got 100%, between 90 and 100% here. So, you know, there was kind of evidence of some subtle effect of, of, um, of, of, of decreasing temperature on, 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 rate, uh, on a decline in, in number of eggs fertilised, but it wasn't really strong. But what really was strong was the yield of, of these advanced stage larvae across temperature. So basically we had this evidence of this critical threshold about 12 degrees, which um, basically above that temperatures above 12 degrees, we got really strong larval yields. Below 12 degrees, the, the urchins just, they, they started to develop, but they just didn't continue very far uh, at all. So we had this really strong evidence of this um, critical threshold in, in temperature. And when, so when I then looked at the long-term data, so some guys that are really ahead of their time uh, who work for the, the National CSIRO um, organisation uh, off Mariah Island, they went out there sampling since the 1940s, and this is a data set that's really pivotal in, in piecing together this whole change in the AC and the biological responses. But when I looked at the month of August um, when, the, when the urchin was spawning, Basically, when we overlay that 12 degree threshold, you can see basically consistent when, when the urchin became really abundant and these barrens started forming on the coast, that we've actually moved into this new regime in the winter time, uh, which is suitable for, for the urchin larvae to develop. So this is really critical first evidence that, uh, that, that we had started, the evidence was starting to line up in terms of the timing, timeline of discovery on the coast, the, the age structure down the coast, and, and the, 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 the key physiological limits for mm. the species. Um, the other thing I did was also compare rates of larval development uh, in Tasmania with that of the native range in New South Wales. And basically, the developmental time against temperature told the story that we really are kind of... These physical, physiological things kind of seem quite fixed, so that um, so there's really a, a, a lack of evidence of any acclimation uh, in, in the cooler Tasmanian environment, which really does suggest that any patterns we see in the, in the abundance of the urchin is something that's more likely to be driven by the environment rather than any um, evolutionary type processes. Um, in terms of the, the genetics work, basically um, the, the populations right across the, the, the global extent of Centra Stephanus. So I should have made the point that basically the global distribution of Centra Stephanus runs from northern New South Wales and southern Queensland down to Tasmania <coughs> and across to northern New Zealand. And this is pretty much where the EAC runs. So basically the EAC runs down here. Part of it bifurcates off and heads to northern New Zealand uh, and the other part um, continues down to Tasmania. And so just at a broad biogeographical bio level, you can really infer the importance of the, the, the the East Australian county in this process. So basically what we find across the, the geographic range of the ocean is quite high levels of mixing. When we looked at a specific case of the range extension region in Tasmania, we found that there was no evidence of genetic bottlenecking um, and that you know, microsatellite and alzheimer approaches revealed that this same pattern. So 
what we seem to have is this really mixed population uh, which suggests that it really is the patterns in the environment that are going to ultimately drive the patterns of abundance that we see in this species, um, yeah, which is, is that point I've just made. If we then um, look at the, the distribution on the coastline uh, relative to that mean uh, winter temperature, basically we find again that where we find these higher abundances of the urchins, they're areas of the coast that actually generally sit above that 12 degree threshold. So, you know, you might get the odd individual here and there, but on, on the whole, you have much higher densities and densities that are, are much more of a concern in terms of forming barrens when, when, you, you, when you're at sites that sit well above that 12 degrees during, during that critical winter period. And then at a, at a local scale uh, level, we, we found evidence of this really strong effect between these sort of offshore headland areas and in, inshore areas. So these are kind of gut feelings that I developed over diving over two years, surveying the 150 sites down the coast. So basically this blue dot here is in an offshore area. You can see the EAC here. This is a wintertime pattern. So the EAC sit, sits offshore. Uh, and, but still actually regulates the temperature of these offshore areas, whereas in these inshore areas get, get a lot cooler during, during that winter. You can see here, this is the abundance of the centra stephanus, very high abundances of these offshore areas, very low abundances in these inshore areas. If you follow this blue line here, around, above that, that critical threshold, you can see most years, and as we're moving through time, generally more years are, are, are thermally suitable for, for the development of this sea urchin. A lot of these inshore areas, they're more at the whims of, of atmospheric heating and cooling. So they get, some of them get a lot warmer in summer, uh, but, but a lot cooler in winter. And this same pattern was played out in three different areas uh, along the eastern Tasmanian coastline. So here you can see these inshore areas heating uh, and cooling a lot more, uh, and then also heating and, and cooling more as well. So um, really there was this evidence that even at local scale, levels that, that areas that were more offshore and had a greater proximity to the East Australian current um, generally had much higher numbers of urchins um, than, than inshore areas. Um, if we then looked at the proportion of those years that sat above that 12 degree threshold, we could come up with some sort of recruitment index here. And here we show that if, you know, if every second winter was, was, uh, was above that threshold, we're kind of starting to get reasonable numbers of sea urchins. So we're kind of seeing there's this critical temperature threshold which is allowing the, the, the sea urchin to establish in a big way on the coast. If we look at these local scale patterns of warming um, using the, the, the coastal warming uh, website, um, and, and we project the data from 1982 to 2011, we can see here uh, across these range of sites down the east coast, um, we see that there's been a, a very large percentage of warming in the summer period. This is when the East Australian current is at its strongest and most people consider it as a summertime phenomenon only. But here you look in wintertime, you see that we've got this warming peak as well, which has really been critical in terms of driving uh, the, the, the local temperatures above that critical threshold of development. So if we look at that August warming rate, so the blue line is what, what the temperature was in 1982 and the red is the warming uh, from 1982 to current, you can see a lot of these sites are now pushing it well above that, that threshold and, and with another 10 or 20 years we expect most of the coastline to be uh, of a suitable thermal regime for, for the sea urchin. Um, so I guess really what the, the, the key take home message here is that the environment in eastern Tasmania is becoming increasingly favourable for the centra stephanus to complete its life cycle and therefore there's much greater increased risk of further barrens formation. Um, so I guess really the doomsday threat here and really what we've got a lot of funding um, to do this sort of courtesy of the, the fishing industries that are really concerned about these degraded habitats is that we, we anticipate that about 50% of all the rocky reef in eastern Tasmania could become barrens. And this is based on what we see within its native, native range, um, the, the remote islands in, in Bass Strait, where it was first observed in Tassie waters, and also on the mainland of Tasmania around St Helens, we see that pattern of half of all the rocky reef as sea urchin barrens. So obviously fairly concerning um, for, for, for industries and, and, and people concerned with biodiversity alike. So really one of the key research questions that I addressed during my PhD was to look and see whether there was any evidence of that, that a reduction in predators on this coastline had actually facilitated the ability of, of the search and to establish and therefore increase the risks of, of barrens forming. Um, and so early on I did some work inside and outside MPAs. This is a, inside an MPA, it's a long-term protected site where you've got these big lobsters that are about uh, four to five kilos in size. This is a really large uh, centra stephanus of so about you know, uh, six to 700 grams in weight. So they get really quite a big, big animal. And you see the lobster here. Um, these big lobsters are able to grapple the urchins, roll them over and attack them from the underside. 
uh, but, but this is a pattern and that only emerged inside MPAs. So I did a lot of video monitoring and basically of 26 events I was able to, to document. The Southern Rock Lobster was, was uh, responsible for 92% of those attacks. Uh, Blue-throated wrasse accounted for 8%, but I've kind of put a little artefact asterisk there because most of those blue throat attacks, well, all of them happened for very small urchins that were um, that were pulled out of their cracks and crevices and exposed on reef surfaces during the daytime. This is a day. To the the labrad here, this ras is is active during the day, um, and 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 at that time, central stiffness remains very cryptic. As I'll show you in a moment, that the the um, the behaviour of, of Centra stephanus is highly nocturnal, so it really doesn't uh, overlap a lot with those fish predators. Um, but it, but the, the key thing is, is the southern rock lobsters are nocturnally uh, a nocturnal forager, so it's foraging on the reef surface when the sea urchins are out of cracks and crevices and vulnerable to being seized, rolled over and ultimately killed. So, um, but I guess in having said that, it's these fish ultimately probably have have driven this this nocturnal behaviour. The, the urchins really are don't want to come out of the crevices during the day because if, if they're small enough, they're, they're extremely vulnerable to fish. Within the native range, there's a, 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 a groper which um, specialises on, on feeding on Centra stephanus and, and so they really stay in crevices, even the big guys, during, during the daytime. Um, so there's a real focus on, on lobsters as predators of, of, of sea urchins in Tasmania. So not only was there, was there my work showing that the big lobsters could eat the, the range-extending sea urchin, but also our other um, local urchin, Heliosidaris, is also preyed upon heavily by, by lobsters, but also those lobsters that are larger than the legal size limit. So the size class of lobsters that have been driven down heavily by fishing as well. So just to summarise this size-specific dynamic, um, here we have the increasing size of, of lobster carapace. Um, these black filled in dots are successful predation events observed in situ. Um, this basically, this, this, physical, this line here represents a physical model. So all of the video observations, you could see clearly that the lobster actually had to stand over the urchin uh, and use its front pair of, of walking legs to grab, grapple the urchin, roll it over and then attack it. So basically that physical model defines the maximum width of these, of whips, width of the span of these first legs um, relative to the spine canopy of the urchin. So unless they could fit their, their mitts right the way around the, the urchin, well, the physical model says they couldn't possibly pr predate on them. Um, and then this dotted line here represents 70% of, of that maximum. And it's interesting, a lot of studies looking at gape size in fish show that fish will optimally um, forage at 70% of their maximum gape size, which seem to do a rather good job of fitting to those uh, field experiments. So there's a lot of other, so these other field in dots are successful predation events, but they are more in contrived lab experiments. So basically, if you follow this, this line, which fitted the field data very nicely, you had to be a lobster of about 140 millimetre carapace to prey on sea urchins as they occur in the wild. So this is the size distribution of sea urchins exposed on the reef. And, and you can see just to prey on a 70 mil uh, urchin, you had to be about a, a lobster of 140 millimetre size class. So um, we did the work comparing survival of the urchin inside and outside the reserve in fished areas uh, where basically these large lobsters are, are functionally extinct. Survival of the urchins is much higher, whereas in these marine protected areas, the survival is, is less than half of that what you see in the fished areas. And this was run over you know, a meaningful amount of time. If we look at the uh, size distribution of lobsters historically in eastern Tasmania, this 1960s, this grey line here, you can see there's this massive uh, bulk of the, of, the, of the lobster population greater than that 140 millimetre carapace size. And that this area, which was then resurveyed in 1990s after uh, 30 years of intensive fishing, um, you can see that there's been a drastic decline in the number of uh, lobsters in, in that area. Um, so, Really, there was starting to put together evidence that there's these big rock lobsters that are uh, that are really important in this system, and they're not a small animal. So, um, but but neither is the sea urchin. So, yeah, we, we have rather you know kind of a form of gigantism down there in in the southern hemisphere going on. But um, so to summarise some of the PhD uh, predation work that I did, uh, rock lobsters were more impre important predators of fish than of, of central stephanus than fish. Only lobsters greater than 140 were about were effective predators in the wild, and that lobsters of that size are, are really rare outside marine reserves. And historically, we, we've shown that they're, they're uh, in a lot lower abundance these days than they were uh, prior to intensive fishing. <coughs> <coughs> Bad idea having a drink. <coughs> <Sorry. coughs> so in terms of putting all the <coughs> those predation trials together, 
it really suggested that um, all, all the evidence suggested that the effect of fishing was really reducing resilience of these kelp bed systems such for a given <coughs> level of recruitment of this um, range extending urchin that the, in, the, in the fish scenario we were much more likely to, to, to move into the search and barren state. So basically yeah, there's a much higher risk of barrens in the, in the, in the uh, fish situation than that of the, uh, the, the more intact, healthy, um, functional ecosystem with, with functional predators. So really we can say that conceptually that these kelp beds that are unfished have got much higher um, resilience than, than those that are heavily fished. Okay, so there are, I guess the key management conclusions out of this, this PhD work was that, um, you know, we really wanted to turn our kelp beds from systems which pretty much approximate this scenario right the way along the coast to something that's of higher resilient and, and less likely to have these major um, changes in the habitat. So that was kind of the management recommendations out of that. And, <coughs> and following that, um, so Craig Johnson, my PhD supervisor, was, was able to secure some more money to, to actually look at how, ways of rebuilding these biomass of large lobsters and that's the postdoc that, that I went on and did and have just recently finished. So really what we were exploring in, my, in the postdoc uh, was looking at the resilience, we'd looked at the resilience of kelp beds but what about the resilience of the barren state? So um, this is the diagram I showed previously but what about if we've already flipped to barrens, can we actually restore predators in this situation to actually effectively reduce the resilience of the barrens to actually ever get some recovery? Um, so the, the, the questions for this postdoc were really, can predatory lobsters be built on urchin barrens ground? Obviously the, lobs, the, the predators need to stay in that area to have, a, have an effect to, uh, in terms of driving any predator recovery. Um, so ultimately is this sort of state reversible? Uh, and, and can the expansions of, of the incipient barrens patches be reduced by rebuilding large lobsters? So taking this situation of low resilience here, trying to rebuild the lobsters and, and actually increase resilience of, of this kelp bed dynamic as well. So we used this rather elaborate and large scale um, and logistically challenging approach of running in a reverse fishing experiment. So where we did this, it was in eastern Tasmania, there's two regions, so in the northeast where we've got more of these widespread barrens occurring. This is, uh, these are five metre contours, so, so the edge of the reef's down here in about 35, 40 metres. This grey area here is the, the Centra Stephanus barrens that just weren't here prior to the, really prior to the 1980s. We've then got this other sort of mixed kelp, um, patchy barrens type zone, and then we've got the, the fringe of community of kelp up, up in the shallow areas where, where wave exposure really keeps the urchins away from that area. Um, so what we're looking at here is more of that, the, so here we have the, the widespread barrens. This is some... Um, AUV footage so you can see the tracks going back and forth. This is a, basically a seascape of about 15 by 10 metres. I'll discuss that more in a moment. But basically this, the, the habitat up there was really this, basically the degraded um, urchin barren state. We also then, in the southeast where, where the, the urchin occurs as these patchy barrens, we then ran the same experiment but looking at, at, at mechanisms of resilience in the kelp beds as opposed to the barrens. So if we look at that, that phase shift dynamic here, so this north bay, this place in the southeast here, we're really looking at mechanisms of forward shift, whereas at Elephant Rock we're looking at the ability of the system to recover. Um, based on, on uh, a, a predator, rebuilding predator abundance. So I think it was a really good example of how we really worked in with fishermen. So we've had a, the institute I work for, so our university joined partners with our fisheries um, um, sort of research organisation really back in the uh, late 90s. And, and so this work with sea urchin predation um, has really, uh, has been alongside with the, the fishing industry for a long time. And so I guess ultimately what came out of it is, is this large scale experiment where we not only uh, rebuilt the numbers of these large lobsters um, that were sourced by these fishermen and they actually helped us do it, um, but we also canvassed these areas as research reserves. So we closed large areas of, of the coastline to fishing and that just doesn't happen overnight because some scientist says oh, it's a good, it'd be a good, good thing to test. So it's been an ongoing thing, uh, interaction with the industry. Um, so really we're looking at this, this forward and reverse shift um, mechanisms at these, at these two sites in these different phase conditions. Um, so, so what we did here, this is kind of just to, to show what, what happened. So we closed the, the area of the reef. Um, we, we, we then started to see a rebuilding of these, the resident lobsters at that site. So these larger 
impo ecologically important size classes started to rebound as soon as fishing was stopped. And then on top of that, we saw the, the effect of the, the predator enhancement. So I've just skipped forward a bit, but if I could just go back. So we basically put four and a half tonnes of, of these big lobsters split between these two areas at a cost of about 67,000 uh, Australian dollars. So it was a really major undertaking. Um, but really what we've shown here is that we could actually effectively rebuild these populations locally in these areas. So not only in the northeast on these barren areas, um, which with some fringing kelp left, but also in these areas which are dominated by kelp, just with patchy, the odd patchy barren. So we're showing that we're actually able to have an effective uh, um, treatment effect in terms of enhancing these large lobsters. Um, so what we also did was actually, the first thing we wanted to know is will these lobsters actually stay on these degraded barren's habitats? Um, all of the prior work suggested from surveys all the way along the coast that as you get um, increasing urchin barrens, basically lobsters just disappear. So we weren't hopeful at all that these lobsters would actually stay there. So we, we used a sampling grid where we would trap regularly across that whole site, but then we also used um, acoustic tracking as well using a, a, a VRAP system. So here's, here's one of these large lobsters. I'm just releasing it down on, on the barren's ground. It's got an acoustic tag mounted on its, on its back here. Um, and then we, we track its movement on these through barrens and, and through kelp bed habitats. So um, right, we did this in the summer and the winter time and, and we, we tracked them for about two months um, uh, on each occasion. So here we are zooming into the site. This is the sea urchin barren here. This is the tracked lobster. You can see its track starting to, to happen. It starts doubling back on itself. And lo and behold, it actually sets up home range within these sea urchin barrens, which is really, uh, we found that really exciting. Um, and, and, and all the individuals, this is uh, 12 different individuals here during a, a summer, a wintertime deployment. Here's their home range polygons. This is where they're centred. As you can see, bulk of it's happening on barrens. In summertime, there's a lot more movement. But again, most of the bulk of the home range occurred within sea urchin barrens habitat, which was just really surprising to us. Um, we also then tracked them in the southeast side around these incipient patch barrens, which are represented by these orange dots here. And basically, we found that yeah, the, the lobsters were moving um, and interacting with those areas where the urchin was establishing. Um, but the really interesting thing here was that from the trapping data, we started to find there was a really strong size dependent um, process going on here in terms of whether lobsters would reside on barrens or not. This top one here is all these large ecologically important size classes of lobsters. Here we've got the barrens in grey and kelp in the black. And as you can see here, most of the catch was higher on, on the barrens than in the kelp bed. Uh, and if we look at the, 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 the differences here, basically we had 1.8 times more large lobsters being caught on barrens and in kelp beds. So this is, you know, this is, uh, represents, each of these dots is 120 trap lifts. Um, so, we, you know, we're looking at large numbers here. Um, medium lobsters, interesting, there was no real difference between kelp and barrens. And, and the really fascinating thing was that these smaller lobsters, there are actually higher catches in kelp beds. So on a barrens, you caught about half of the, the, small lob, the number of small lobsters that you would in a kelp bed. Um, so it's interesting when we look at these widespread patterns from the coast, keep in mind these are fished areas. So basically um, these negative relationships are really driven by the, the abundance of small lobsters only. So what we've found in this reserve situation and trying to rebuild the ecosystem, it really is a clear demonstration that, that patterns we observed in fished areas don't really tell us a lot about the natural baseline state of the system. So. Um, yeah, we found a really strong size, size dependent interaction. Um, these big lobsters seem to be fine on the barrens. They were happy there. Small lobsters seem to really depend on the kelp, which is probably uns not unsurprising given that their dietary breadth is much more focused on those, you know, 250 odd little invertebrate species that hang in among the kelp. So um, they're a really clear result in terms of the size distribution. If we take, zoom in and take a closer look at the barrens, this is that AEV imagery. Each one of these virtual posters are metre by a metre, and you can take this virtual dive. So this is imagery which has been draped over acoustics, and you can basically go along and do your virtual dive. The point I make here is that you see how bouldery, like there's a lot of boulder, a lot of high relief habitat for the lobsters. Um, this is the AEV imagery during the day. Each one of these tracks is about a metre wide. Um, and the key thing with this urchin is what I was saying before is it's highly nocturnal, but before I make that point, here's one of these big, large, translocated lobsters just hanging out in the crevice, right next to an urchin. This is about a you know, four, five kilo lobster, and this is an urchin. You can sort of see how big these urchins really are. You know, they're up to about six, seven hundred grams in weight. So um, 
the point is, though, is there's, there's no shortage of actual structure in terms of the, the rock. So these lobsters weren't really depending on kelp per se, although when they, when they were small, they certainly were. Um, so we really concluded from this is that there were few lobsters on barrens because they've been fished down um, and that lobsters can actually be re rebuilt on these barren grounds. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing from these negative correlations. Was, was, there, was there few lobsters on barrens because it was undesirable habitat or was there few lobsters on barrens because they've been fished down? This work really strongly concludes that it's, it's, the, it's that impact of fishing that really drives um, that, those patterns. So this is the daytime imagery, then you look at the nighttime, and then all the surgeons are out and heavily grazing on, on the reef surface. Um, if we look at the, the activity patterns of the urchins, so this is daytime here, so this is around midnight here at one. Um, so you can see that there's just no movement of the urchins earlier in the, in the, in the daytime. As soon as dark, darkness encroaches, the urchins are out foraging on the reef surface. And if we look at the, the tracking of those large lobsters, this is their activity patterns in summer and winter. And you can see that their foraging activity is heavily overlaying with, overlapping with that time when the urchins are vulnerable to being preyed upon. Um, this should play here. Yeah, so this is, this is currently during the day. You can see the urchins just sit there really doing nothing. Uh, and as soon as night occurs, so as soon as that red, uh, red light comes on, um, the urchins are off and grazing away and, and covering a hell, hell of a lot of, um, a hell of, a lot of the, the, the reef surface. And then daylight comes up and then, and then the lobs, and then, the, um, and then they head back to their crevices. And obviously all of this work here, I'm not sure whether I made the point, but this is all taken with, with infrared imagery. So... Um, so all of this activity in terms of predation was really happening during that night time. That was the key period. Um, just on that predation, so this is comparison in fished versus reserve sites. Now, we've touched on a bit with Bernard's stuff with um, the, the role of shelter in, in this story of, of predation risk. In a fished environment, if, if you're an urchin and you've got shelter, your survival is extremely high. If you're a fish, in a fished area, so very few predators, but you're exposed out of crevices, you actually suffer a fair bit of mortality as well. But if you're uh, within a shelter inside of marine protected areas, um, you actually decline quite uh, to a large degree as well. But, but ultimately, if you're inside a marine protected area, exposed from crevices, your mortality rates, uh, basically, um, you, you go extinct in, in that situation. Um, so, in terms of this work, really, the, the key point here is this sort of reserve factor. So here we're looking, comparing search and survivors that are uh, um, able to seek cryptic shelter or, or exposed. And basically, this shelter factor says that for a small urchins, um, their survival is six times more greater um, if, if they've actually got shelter in a reserve than if they don't. Uh, for large, for large um, urchins, that, that importance of shelter is actually reduced a bit, but you can still see that it's, you know, it's, it's three times greater if you're able to seek shelter inside a reserve than, than not. Um, and, and, and really, I think this, this is really important in terms of any expectations of ecosystem recovery. You've really got to consider that habitat, um, because if, if, if there's a lot of crevice um, structure there then, and, they're, and the urchins are able to mitigate predation, then it's likely going to take a lot longer for these, these um, ultimately for the, for the kelp to come back. So here we have the AUV image during the day, uh, and then at night time you see the urchins head up and graze in amongst this kelp area here. So obviously if they're out here on these open shelf areas, that's when they're much more susceptible to predation. So what we'd anticipate through time is actually an increase of the kelp bed, so in advance of the kelp bed, um, based on the change in behaviour of, of the sea urchins becoming less bold under the threat of predation. So, okay, what did we see over three years when we closed these reserve areas? So we monitored habitats and urchin population at the experimental and control sites over well, two and a half years. Um, we used dot in situ assessment of belt transects. We also then looked at fine scale mapping around that kelp interface where we expect there might be most uh, recovery of kelp. Um, and then in the southeast, we also, we could take um, we could estimate the size of these patches quite effectively and look at their size through time to see whether there's any change inside these areas where we'd enhance predators relative to sites where, um, where, pred where the patches, barrens, were also occurring but the, the predators weren't enhanced. So, OK, well, what do we observe? OK, in this northeast side on the widespread barrens, basically not a, not a hell of a lot at all. We saw here, this is the, the numbers of urchins inside the reserve in red. Oh, this is the kelp cover. So at the habitat level, level we really didn't see anything at all. At the, at the, um, at the population level, of, of the, of the search and population level, we saw evidence of some decline, but really not at all standing out from variability in the control sites. 
For the native urchin, which is a shorter spine urchin um, and, and generally thought to be much more susceptible to predation, we saw a stronger decline there. But again, this ultimately wasn't um, borne out um, relative to the, the variability in the, uh, in the control sites. Um, we mapped this kelp boundary, so we basically put in stainless pins marking where the boundary was at the start of the experiment. Here we saw, it was in really encouraging early on, we saw this sort of advance of kelp into these deeper areas, um, but kind of then it waxed and waned, and by the end of it, we'd seen some increase of, of, of kelp bed habitat there, but it really wasn't striking. Um, if we look at this kelp, so this is metres on this, on this axis here, and this is at Elephant Rock, so where we've... Um, the research reserve of enhanced predators, and you see there was some kelp advance, but it kind of waxed and waned, and by the end of it wasn't really different to, to the other sites. But of note, there was one of the control sites which really took off, and on, the, on average, the barrens actually, or well, the kelp retreated, so it was overtaken by overgrazing by about a metre and a half on average over, over about a 500 metre stretch of coastline. Um, in the southeast, uh, where it was just these patchy barrens situation, we found um, a slight decline in the cover of, of barrens, but this was not a significant effect. This is looking at the site level, so belt, you know, data we got from belt transects. Uh, we saw some increase in one of these control sites, which really took off. In terms of the urchin abundance, we saw a, a fairly uh, a strong and a statistically significant decline inside the reserve relative to the control sites. Um, which one of the control sites really took off, um, consistent with this increase in barrens. In terms of the, the Heliosidaris, um, we saw a decline there as well, which, was, which wasn't quite significant, but certainly um, you know, within the reserve, very much a strong decline, but didn't bear out relative to the control areas. And also abalone decline, and this was a significant effect as well. So these really combine, if you look at this total benthic prey community for lobsters, we actually saw an effect there at that particular site. Um, the other thing we did was mark and, and monitor these patch barrens. So we estimated the size through time. Um, and here, here's some sort of photographic evidence of this showing at the start towards the end we had some of these patches are actually declining in size. Uh, and if we look at the, the North Bay Research Reserve where we in, built the, the abundance of lo large lobsters, we actually saw a, on average about a 40% decline in, in, in the area of these barrens patches relative to the start. Whereas at the control sites we actually saw the opposite. We saw these barrens patches expanding. Um, and really what, what was critical in all of this was this, this patch size dynamic that was going on. Along the uh, x-axis we have increasing um, patch size of the original patches. Um, some of those patches that are small to begin with, you see at the control sites, some of them increased by a massive percent. Um, and as you get bigger, the, the increase was, was less. But also in terms of the recovery, it was mainly these smaller patches which showed a much relatively greater recovery. So basically the take home message here, so this is at 500,000 square metres, that's the patch size of that widespread barrens where we just saw absolutely really no evidence of any change at that scale. But So there really seemed evidence of this critical patch size dynamic. So if we look at this in terms of the, the phase shift dynamics, basically um, that preventing these barrens getting big in the first place, uh, you know, so doing something about it when these patches are small is, is really where we have most chance of actually having an effect on this dynamic. So once the whole system flips into barrens, even though we've rebuilt lobster populations, we've spent $67,000 trying to rebuild these large populations of lobsters, we know they're actually staying on the barrens, we just don't see a blip. And we've been able to look at the decline in that reserve and use some modelling approaches to show that we need about 30 odd years to see any recovery. Um, and that's obviously the big factor there is how much actual recruitment of sea urchins we're going to get into the future. So just going on the current rates of recruitment we've seen, um, we really need about 30 or 40 odd years to get any recovery uh, on widespread barrens. However, even within this two and a half year phase, we're up sitting up here on these incipient patch situation. Um, we've shown that even by rebuilding the number of lobsters there, we can actually um, have, have a, a significant effect on, on the abundances of urchins and, and ultimately the, the size of these patches, uh, particularly when they're small. Um, so I guess just finishing off, let's just look at the context of this situation. Again, this is um, the Barron's patch size across the coast and this region here. So this is on a log scale. Some of these points here are these widespread barren grounds in the northeast. 
Um, but as you can see, as you move down the coast, you're getting um, smaller and smaller barrens patches. So um, the, the reality is we've got few of these really widespread barrens ground, but the, the point is, is that in terms of actually having any effect on this system, in terms of rebuilding predators and rebuilding resilience of the kelp system, we've, we've got to do it when these patches are small. So really, the management issue here is, is, is looking at preventative management rather than um, just a management response. You know, usually in systems, once these things are flipped, you know, the management response, um, you know, everyone gets excited about there's been this change, but really that the horse has bolted and it's um, really too far gone to, to, to have an effective, um, um, uh, effective um, uh, mitigation. So really, yeah, you're looking at proactive management in this phase. Down here, we're really looking at reactive management and, and really it's, it's a, a completely different ball game. Um, so in terms of summarising, um, we get back to this schematic here where, where the effect of fishing has really reduced the resilience of kelp beds. We've shown that this reverse fishing has actually effectively reduced the resilience of the barren so that um, through time and, 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 and everything else being equal, the, the resilience of these barrens is much less so that the, the ability for the system to come back is, is, is much higher. Um, the, the really important point here is that on these barren grounds, by continuing to fish, we're actually enhancing the resilience of this barren state. A point I didn't make, but in the trapping exercise, we found that we actually were more effective at catching the, the, the total population of lobsters on barrens. So once that kelp disappears, you're actually more effective at extracting the remaining lobsters there. So there's all these feedbacks which is driving this down, making the system more and more resilient. So. Um, yeah, and we also demonstrated that once this system is kind of losing its resilience, uh, as, as long as it's staying in that kelp bed, we can certainly rebuild it even in short time scales. Um, so to sum up, this phase shift between kelp and barrens is influenced by this critical patch size dynamic. I think that's really important in this whole story. And that an ounce of prevention is worth a tonne of cure. Um, by protecting the suite of urchin predators vulnerable to fishing, the MPAs maximise the resilience of the desirable kelp bed state and duly diminish resilience of the barrens. Um, but it's not just, I mean, this has all been about lobsters because it's been quite a neat example, but the reality is, is that maximising the total predation risk across the board of all types of predators is really where we should be at. And also the point I make is that MPAs locking up the whole east coast doesn't achieve a whole bunch of, you know, achieves one objective. It doesn't achieve objectives that the fishing industry are after. So a lot of the modelling we're doing now is working out how best to rebuild these populations of large lobsters without having, uh, with minimising the effect on, on the actual lobster industry themselves. Um, and yeah, so to acknowledge, there's a whole bunch of industry partners here. Um, but but Craig Johnson was uh, my PhD supervisor, and he's been um, he and I have worked together on this system for for over a decade now. So on that, I'll finish there. And take any questions. Thank you.